Okay, we've got folks trickling in here. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'd like to welcome everyone to Mentoring for Counselor Longevity. I'm Melanie Meacham. I am entering my third year um, in the mental health program for counseling, hoping to work with children. Um, today, we have Jeff Rice speaking, and um, I, I'm actually looking forward to picking up a few tips here myself. So <laughs> thanks so much. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, good morning. Um, welcome, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here as I get to talk with the uh, cream of the counseling crop, as it were. Um, and I, I just kind of want to start off with a really quick question. And if you would, in the in the chat, um, could you tell me, have you, do you have a mentor? Just a simple yes or no. We're not that, um, we're not that big, so we don't have to have a whole lot of formalities. And uh, there it is. Okay, I got a no. No. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. All right. So I'm going to throw out one more question, kind of a little different, too, which is, are you serving as a mentor? Um, and it's just something else just to kind of think about, because what we're going to find is that this is sort of a double edged sword. Uh, I'd also like to take the time to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm kind of getting over a little bit of a cough here. Um, I'd also like to take the time to let you all know that this is, um, this presentation is more about, it's kind of based on a lit review. Uh, there's actually more research that's going to be coming uh, in the next few months, but that is, um, that is pending. So you're going to actually see a few open-ended questions here at the end that you might go, hmm, seems like there would be room for growth and uh, even for some improvement. So let's see if we can get this to advance. There we go. All right. So um, as we're working through this, Here's your outline, uh, kind of our learning objectives here. We're going to look at uh, just uh, the, the need for having uh, professional mental health longevity. And we're also going to differentiate between some trauma, some vicarious trauma, burnout, and compassion fatigue. Oftentimes we use them interchangeably, but they are not truly the same. Um, we're also going to look at maybe some, some things you want to look at um, and get for as a mentor. And uh, I also want to re really quick acknowledge, I have about eight seconds, I realize the research shows I have about eight seconds to get your attention. And I know that I'm only going to have that attention for about 10 to 15 minutes so, uh, before you start to drift off. So I'm going to do my best to kind of keep this engaging and kind of keep this moving along. I mean, after all, the TED Talks are, you know, max out at what, 21 minutes or something like that. So we're going to, we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Although my technology doesn't want to work with me today. Um, so first of all, there's a huge need. And I want to point this out that, you know, all of these are straight off of these are um, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, uh, mental health america as well and, and what you're going to see is that there's been a, just this spike of of depression anxiety screens and the, just the numbers are kind of overwhelming now i want to draw your attention to this last particular piece this last little sentence here one in five adults live with mental illness this does not include those individuals who are in isolation or feeling lonely. And I know that's kind of a strange thing to put in here, but I just stumbled across this in the last, well, this week when I was, or last week when I was working on this. And this was literally just released from the Surgeon General's office, May 3rd. Um, Dr. Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General, 
there's an advisory on loneliness, isolation, and a lack of connection in the United States. Even before COVID-19, about half the population reported measurable levels of loneliness. And I want to bring you down here to lacking connection can increase risk for health, for premature health uh, death to levels that are comparable with daily smoking. We are ultimately um, herd animals, right? We, we live in packs and that's just what we do. So the level of, uh, of us being connected is so very vital. And I just want to take a moment and really acknowledge that. And you're going to see how that kind of ties in. But all we're really doing is kind of pointing out to you that there is a tremendous need going on for uh, longevity of counselors. And this, is, this was another kind of shocking uh, figure that I stumbled across in the research, which is 85% of counselors in training are already feeling burnout, are already experiencing those symptoms. And, you know, I, I, we all recognize this is literally a room full of counselor educators and counselors and therapists. And so we all recognize the demands of the program. But this just was a little shocking from the standpoint of we have people starting out in this field that are almost that are going to be behind the eight ball. And that is going to lead to things like burnout, compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma. Now, if you're like me, uh, I've been doing this full time for the last uh, 13 to 15 years. I'd have to go back and actually count it up. Um, so, you know, we tend to work in the in, in some populations that, you know, are maybe a little bit uh, draining sometimes. You know, I always think back to Nietzsche. Um, when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. And it really is, this is such an important part because what we're doing now is we're working on uh, you know, and there's so much going on in terms of counselor care and self efficacy you know, self-care and those kinds of things. And, and it's so important because that's what's going to help keep us into, you know, keep us in the field itself. Now, some of you are familiar with burnout. Burnout can happen to anyone. There's actually no field that's immune to it. Um, and it has been defined as a gradual decrease in work engagement because of chronic exposure to stressful situations. Um, and it's similar to compassion fatigue. But incidentally, I want to point out that it does not require exposure to trauma. And what's interesting, especially as, as a room full of mental health counselors here, we are consistently exposed to trauma. Right. And we're going to get into that more. Uh, I also just want to touch really quick depersonalization. Sometimes people are like, well, what is depersonalization? It's really just that de detached response to others. It's really kind of losing, uh, losing those connections, which are already in jeopardy from the previous slide. So kind of an interesting fact here. Uh, I want to show you a very quick video. And and kind of change up the voice in the room here. Um, but this is new, new information. Burnout, not just a figure of speech uh -huh. anymore. It's actually been declared a legitimate medical diagnosis by the World Health Organization. It is officially defined as a syndrome, a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully <laughs> managed. And there are three main symptoms. Here they are, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or negativity and cynicism related to one's job, and reduced professional effectiveness. Check, check, and check. No, no. NBC News medical correspondent who is very invigorated and happy to be here this morning, Dr. John Torres. So, I mean, a lot of people 
certainly have times of stress at their jobs. How do you know if you're actually experiencing this condition known as burnout? You know, it's interesting when people hear the symptoms, they're like, okay, I've been there before. I've yes. seen and, and we all have stress. Stress goes hand in hand with what we do every single day. But we're able to handle that stress, and that's what we do as humans. We get the stress, we handle it, we get it under control, come back the next day, do it over and over again. If that stress goes continuous, then it starts turning into burnout. And burnout is one of those things that doesn't go away. And I always tell people, you can tell you have burnout if you simply just just don't want to go into work, don't want to be there, or having issues with work. And so again, the two go hand in hand. Stress is something we can handle and control. Burnout, not necessarily. Well, hey, what, what can we do about it? I mean, a lot of folks have jobs that are very stressful, and oftentimes I would imagine that is what leads to the burnout. You can quit on live TV. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Wow. I'm not quite there yet. Wow. First and foremost, you want to recognize the symptoms. You want to recognize the cynicism, the fact that you're at work and you simply don't want to be there. You're burning out. You're not able to enjoy the things you used to enjoy. Try and take time off from work if you can, and that means just completely disconnecting. And like you said, over the three-day holiday, hopefully people were able to do that and get away a little bit, and that can reinvigorate you. And if worse comes to worse, and none of these seem to be working, then simply look for another job if you can. Consider changing jobs. What should, can management do to help alleviate this? So management can do a couple of things, and one of them is they can give you time off where they don't contact you and they don't get a hold of you, and that's probably the biggest thing because we've all been there on the weekends where we're answering emails and taking care of things. If you can just check out completely, and I tell people, imagine if you just went on a camping trip and you couldn't answer your cell phone for three days right. or you couldn't get an email for three days, that's the kind of break you need. And it might not be three days long, but you need it every now and then. And if you're getting to the point, look at your employees. If they look like they're starting to burn out, if they're starting to be cynical, if they're starting to be a little snippy at work and arguing with each other, productivity is going down, that's probably a good sign that burnout's starting to happen. And that's when a good manager needs to come in and say, we need to take But if you right. can't realistically quit or get a new job, is there anything that you can do, just little things on the job every day to help out? So there's little things you can do on the job to help out. And again, first and foremost, recognize that burnout is happening and try and see if you can disconnect a little bit. Talk to your managers and say, hey, this is one of those things I really want to take care of. I really want to get under control. And then when you go home, a big thing to think about is simply get away from this for a while. Yep. Even if it's just for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, disconnect from your cell phone so you're not constantly on it. And that doesn't just necessarily mean work, but social media as well. Even if you could get take a little walk at work or something, it would probably yeah. help a little bit. Me time is extremely important. Yeah. And, and the, the thing is, is you don't want to work. You don't want to live to work. You want to work to live. Amen. That's yeah, the big yeah. thing. Dr. John. Thank you very you much. Burnout. All right, so a little bit about burnout with a little bit of uh, even some techniques in there. Uh, but I thought it was just such a good uh, a good little snippet. And it's really interesting that now burnout has actually become recognized by the World Health Organization. Uh, so what we're realizing is that this is far more widespread. Now, I know that some of you are even going, well, okay, but how are we tying this into mentoring? Give me just two or three more minutes and I'm going to show you exactly how this is going to tie together. Right. Compassion fatigue is obviously specific to the helping or helping professions. So these are your healthcare staff, uh, the rabbinical and spiritual leaders, uh, therapists. Right. This is where those who are constantly uh, helping others kind of move through the next thing. Um, we've also got. Uh, just some symptoms here. We have poor self-care, stress, muscle tension, uh, escapism, bottling up our emotions, insomnia, um, overeating. Yes, I said that to myself. Um, emotional withdrawal even. Uh, and, and really what happens is that when we're caring for someone over time, the mental and physical exhaustion of caring for sick or traumatized people, uh, it can actually breed apathy and indifference. And we actually become callous um, towards the pain and suffering of other people. And friends, once we get to that point, we're of no use to our clients, right? But not only are we of no use to our clients, Friends, we're of no use to just about anybody at that point, right? Think about your families. Think about friends, right? Vicarious trauma. Hmm? Uh, basically, and this is a little bit different because this is where uh, um, this can be particularly dangerous to clinicians. 
because what this will do is it will it will begin to alter our beliefs about the world and ourselves, right? Um, think about it like this, you know. I mean, and all you have to do, really, if we just take a minute, all you really have to do is consider turning on the news this afternoon or this evening. Do no more than that. And it becomes very easy to think that the world is not a safe place or that, you know, I, I, I shouldn't go outside even. Now, if we compound that with the exposure to trauma that others have endured, imagine what that does in a, in a synergistic way. Right. And I want to point out one little note, and that is that it's interesting. The, the literature is relatively sparse when it comes to vicarious trauma. It's, it's not as rich as you, would, as you might think. So what are we doing now? What are we doing now to help keep ourselves going? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked. Some of us are going on rampages, <laughs> right? Some of us might go on rampages. Uh, the, the caption here, of course you feel great. These things are loaded with antidepressants. Um, just a little psychotherapy humor there. Um, and that, you know, that may be part of it. As far as cries for help, Sometimes we ingest a little too much into substances. Um, buying plants. <laughs> um, this one is something that I'm a little guilty of, right? This is something that I'm a little guilty of, which is cat videos on YouTube, right? I dog videos. I I am the I am the quintessential cat and dog guy where I will sit there and watch the the cat and the cucumber or you know whatever it is just for hours because it it helps me to kind of get out of that uh out of that headspace now just very quick uh if you would um if you want if you feel comfortable and there's no obligation obviously but if you feel comfortable uh what are you doing now to keep yourself going right what are you doing now to keep yourself going Writing, yes, absolutely. I love it. I love the writing. I love the writing. Um, I was just talking to a client earlier this morning about gal about uh, journaling and the importance of it. Walking right now, listening. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to throw this out here for you. Uh, yoga, yes. Yoga, getting out to nature. Oh, karaoke. Look at that. Um, I have like four songs that just popped into my head now. Um, the gallows humor, uh, and let's be fair, this is not this is not necessarily healthy or unhealthy. Uh, time and a place, all right, time and a place. Uh, I think most of us have either been exposed to this or used it ourselves. Um, and that is absolutely an option. Um, does it does follow us mindfulness based stress reduction is something else that's really big um and these are really good helpful things right mbsr if you're not familiar it's kind of a combination of mindfulness meditation um noticing feelings thinkings um feelings actions behaviors patterns of thought even impulses and it has a wonderful way of uh, of increasing your well-being. Uh, and it's very well proven, very well researched. And then there's organizational interventions. And this is one of those things that I look at. And I, I'm going to confess to you that I've done them. Clinical supervision. Well, we all enjoy sharing our shortcomings with the group. And all of you can sit there and go, oh, well, I don't think of it that way. But at some point you did. All right. Because we've all felt that. We've all felt that. Oh, man. Now, now the group is going to tell me. 
how what I've done wrong. Right. We all want to think that, well, asking for help won't ever be held against us. But sometimes, you know, that that thought crosses your mind. And some of you actually view your supervisors like this, where you're kind of standing there watching you at work, just waiting for something to happen. Uh, and, and it's not supposed to be that way, right? It's not. Um, but I know that that's sometimes the, the idea or sometimes the thoughts that happen. Um, support groups, team building, getting the group outside of the office so that they can uh, hit the the build cohesion, esprit de corps, interact with each other in a, in you know the, in that non office environment. Sometimes uh, when I was in the military, we used to call this mandatory fun day. Um, but just know that these are options. Some places will even offer support groups. But here's where I want to take you for just a minute. And this is why that we're going to land into mentoring. The meta-analysis of 35 years of research on the effectiveness of organizational interventions that reduced or were aimed at reducing emotional exhaustion showed. Anybody want to take a guess? No one you can pop off mute. Drum roll, please. No significant effect on burnout or any type of emotional exhaustion. All right. And this is where I started to really dig in to the mentoring idea. Because what happens is individual interventions showed the most promise. All right. They are the most this is this is what it's where it's at the individual connection the individual right now we want to keep counselors in the field because look at everything that i've just shown you this is what we're up against right this is what the future looks like so i'm proposing and suggesting and this is what and again we're going to talk more about the data but this is what mentoring actually entails, right? Now, when we talk about mentoring, first of all, let's take the mentor relationship, all right? It's future-oriented oftentimes, right? But it's also right now. It's uh, egalitarian, so it's non-evaluative. It doesn't have that hierarchy that oftentimes you feel when you're dealing with your supervisor because the you know supervision by definition is evaluative is evaluative them evaluative i can speak um but when we consider that this is about a very egalitarian support right and it doesn't mean that your supervisor may be able to establish that, but they may not too, right? And what's interesting is that the deeper you, do, you dive into this field, into the idea of mentoring, do you realize counseling doesn't really do mentoring? It's not as often as you think. Um, now, some of that, and this is, there's, there's going to be, I'm going to actually toss a couple of questions to you. Um, I wonder if it is, um, I wonder if it is absolutely related to, well, we do two years of supervision or three years of supervision, right? So it's kind of built into that, and that could be mistaken as a mentoring relationship. I don't know. I'm not telling you that it is or it isn't. I just wonder. And that's actually one of the things that I'm I'm just leaving out there to be unanswered. Um, but please feel free. And, you know, if you've got any thoughts on that, feel free to come off a of chat off of mute. Just kind of speak your mind. And again, we're not that big of a group, so I don't feel like we need to. You know, I don't feel like we're going to be 
really we don't need robert's rule of order or anything like that going on i think we can all just <laughs> kind of kind of speak and be okay um having and this is what most a lot of this research now we've had to dig into some of the business businesses into some of the business uh models where they actually have this um these mentoring programs and you're, you're going to see here um as you're looking through this i know one of the questions always become what to look for in a mentor right what to look for in a mentor well obviously someone who's going to show you um how to get through the system right uh, and, and we're going to talk about this again in just a minute, a little bit deeper. But as you're looking for who to, you know, who to really come up against or a co to not come up against, to come um, alongside of, that's where, what I was thinking. If you're looking to for your person to come alongside, you got to consider what stage you are in your career, right? You also have to figure out how much time you want to invest. And what do you need right now? What do you actually need right now? Because a lot of times these are these are the keys that they're going to be able to help you navigate, right? Um, I kind of broke this into four types of mentors, and they're not. And actually, it's it's kind of interesting because when you look at the different types of mentors what we see is there's a lot there's very little standardization um but when we think about your traditional mentor the long-term person that you're going to be around that may help you choose company a over company b who may you know hey this seems like this would be a good fit for you let me make a suggestion on how you can develop yourself uh that kind of thing Right. Now, the affinity based mentor is something is someone that you have in common, something you have in common. So I kind of lump this into sort of that guide mentality, which might be somebody in a new workplace. Uh, they show you how to navigate the processes within the organization. Um, and you think, oh, well, that can't be. That can't be that hard. And I just spoke to somebody who's a nurse. And he just transferred from one hospital to the next. And he's been at the same hospital in the same hospital system, the exact same system for like 15 years. And yet, as soon as he moved, everything changed because the numbers were different to the pharmacy, the people, the, the connections, even some of the processes, despite being even within the same system, they were not standardized. So even, you know, even if you're changing a location, sometimes having somebody within that space that knows that system is going to be a major benefit. Uh, of course, there's peer mentors. Peer mentors can often provide an insight, safe place to vent even. Um, and then your subject matter experts or your SMEs. Uh, and these are your people with who are coming along, you're coming alongside of for particular help, goals, uh, projects, <clears throat> dissertation committee, um, you know, that I'll throw that out there as well. These are kind of your subject matter experts. And hopefully they're, you know, they're not only going to be part of that committee, but also people that you're able to, to get in touch with or stay in touch with over time and continue to utilize, you know, those, that, that expertise. Um, there are benefits. There are so many benefits in the mentoring process. And I'm going to just kind of speak a little bit about some of these in particular. And I promise we won't be a whole lot. Um, being around somebody who's been in the field longer than you have can help you navigate processes. Right. So I'm I'm just going to throw one out that many of us deal with on a regular basis. Has anyone struggled with dealing with insurance panels? He said <laughs> he said out loud to no one in particular. 
Um, <laughs> right? I mean, this is the <clears throat> the problem is that we we go into this insurance panel and we say, oh yes, this is going to be amazing, and they're going to pay you blah blah blah, and the the your patient, your client gets it, it, much quicker access. And you're thinking to yourself, oh man, this is amazing. This is such a great system. And then you get the denial letter <laughs> because you put the wrong date in the wrong spot. Or my favorite one, you left the dot, the period. So instead of uh, writing F41.1, you wrote F411. Um, and now you're frustrated and now you're developing these, you know, just this, this, oh, this is so difficult. Uh, or better yet, how many of you, has anybody ever noticed that insurance companies are basically on like a net 30? So they have about 30 days to pay you. Um, and if you aren't expecting that when you first and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not throw anybody under the bus, but if you're not expecting that, then you start to get frustrated, right? Yes, and Dr. Crowley, and then they, they audit their records two years later, and they say, oh, we pre-authorized this, but we were wrong, and now you have to, you have to pay us this much money back. And I go, wait, what? <laughs> um. And these are all things that become frustration, right? They're all things that begin to just eat away and become those stressors, become those reasons for burnout, right? For decreased job satisfaction, because um, I don't, there used to be this, this one of the memes floating around, and I'm just thinking of it now, so I'm sorry it's not in your... Um, it's not in the PowerPoint deck, but there used to be this meme floating around about what I, what people think I do, what my mom thinks I do, right? What I actually do, excuse me. And in that, as they were, you know, people are like, oh, well, this is what society thinks you do, right? And, and they have all these really lofty goals. And then the last the last picture is this poor, this poor therapist that's just sitting with just charts, you know, stacked, files stacked on as, as you know, up past their ears kind of thing as they're trying to get the paperwork done. And I go, yeah, that's that's actually pretty true. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I apologize again. As you're as you, having somebody who's been there though. Right. This is going to help reduce a lot of that frustration. It's going to help reduce a lot of that. Um, it, just the the burnout factors. Right. Um, one of the other things that I put on here is a way to cut through the minutia. Um, I was the most politically correct word I could think of to say there was minutia. Um, but I think you all know where I was going with it. There's actually studies that show, um, there's actual studies that show that people who pursue mentors will actually have a, uh, a, a, they will have a faster rate of growth, right? Now, a lot of those studies come out of the business side of things, but there is evidence that supports that. Right. It also allows you to avoid a lot of the pitfalls. You know, one of the things that I find myself doing at this stage in my career, I spend a lot of time with my young therapists, right? My supervisees, where I'm saying, okay, what are you going to do? Well, I think about, I think I'm going to apply here. Okay, well, the problem with applying there, this is what their work environment is like, this is what they're going to tell you, you know, is I've been in this, I've been in my community for a long time. Um, it is just very important that we continue that we continue to remember that these, uh, that we can really help people avoid a lot of heartache. Um, I did some consulting for somebody who's starting up a practice. 
And again, they came to me and I said, I said, well, let's talk about this, this, and this. And they said, gee, I never thought about that. I'm like, well, I get it. You know, I didn't either until I made the mistakes. So learn from my mistakes. Um, diversity issues oftentimes can even be overcome um, qu quicker. And this is where I want to land us for just a few minutes is the human connection. Um, if I take you all the way back to the first part of this presentation, uh, we were talking a lot about our um, about the need, right? About the loneliness, about the isolation. And knowing that you are not alone in this, because see, unfortunately, our field exists in a bunch of silos, right? Even if you are part of a group practice, or even if you're working community mental health, right? Where you're like, oh, well, I'm in this organization and I have five, six clinicians in here with me. We're, we still operate in a very isolated manner because of things like HIPAA and confidentiality. So it does become very easy for us to feel that disconnection, to feel that, that isolation, and to feel like, wow, man, we are the only ones going through this. So when we take this back to mentoring, taking this back to someone who knows, who's been there, who's walked through this, and you can say, wow, what did you do? How do you do this? Right? How did you navigate this? That is, that's what it's all about, right? So whether your mentor is about dissertation, right? And that's perfectly possible, uh, likely. Is it about your, um, what do you call it? If it's, if it's, it's not dissertation, if it's about starting a new place, if it's just about, trying to figure out what direction you want to go career-wise, right? All of these different things, they're so important that we maintain those, uh, that we go to people who are able to say, hey, listen, this is, this is what works for me. Now, you don't have to do it my way, but if you can give it a shot, right? Uh, internship site, mm, what's, tell us more, Melanie. Can you tell, tell me more about that? Because now I'm curious. Um, I think that's a vital place to have that mentoring re relationship, um, especially in going to school online, where you don't have a local um, support system from the university. So I, I've been fortunate to have people here to kind of show me the ropes and, and give me some guidance because that first week I felt like I had no idea what I was doing and, and I needed to figure it out. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And hopefully my hope is that your internship sites um, do that and they do that well. I really, that is my hope. I'm very, um, I'm very, very passionate about that. I'm very, very passionate about supervision and about developing new counselors. Um, my supervision experience was not like that. All right, I'll just self-disclose for just a minute. My supervision, no, seriously, my supervision was passing each other in the hall. Are you good? Do you need anything? Um, if you do, let me know. And that was off you go. Um, now that's, and, and when I'm, when I'm throwing rocks, okay, I'm not throwing rocks. I'm telling you, this was my experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of other or th things that were going into that in terms of time constraints. So I don't, you know, this is not about, you know, throwing rocks or criticism. It's just, that was my experience. It was very, it was very disconnected and it was just like, all right, well, good luck to you kind of thing. Um, so I haven't I have started to... internship yet. I'm just trying to get my foot in the door. So that's been helpful to have a mentor. Yeah. Um, now I did internship for um, 
elementary education when I was a teacher. And it was very different. Um, so it, I'm, I feel like I'm learning like fire by baptism a little bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'm doing it. So, yeah. Well, I'll tell you that the best way, the fastest way to learn is to get into the deep end of the pool. So <laughs> you want to learn to swim and learn to swim quickly, jump in the deep end of the pool. So um, I'm going to take just a minute and kind of circle back for um, and just check in as I've been checking through these different things. Does anybody have any questions regarding or comments regarding either vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue um no okay i just wanted to i realized that i kind of blew through that a little bit and i actually had it planned um to be able to have some poll questions for you but what i'm going to do is i'm going to bring those questions at the end all right uh, because i couldn't get them uploaded into the zoom room so we're going to do the poll questions at the end um just that way we have a little bit of extra question and answer time um but do you have any questions what questions do you have about maybe the mentoring process or looking for a mentor um anyone no okay i don't have a question but i have a comment about sure. something you said earlier about sure. kind of the blurred lines of clinical supervision and mentor, I would, I agree to the fact that in the counseling world, I think initially a clinical supervisor, that role was kind of developed with a mentor in mind, but obviously now with our new clinicians that were growing, that role distinction can be made a lot clearer. Yeah. So I think I think that's an important point of kind of defining the counselor mentor versus the clinical counselor, the counseling clinical supervisor piece. Right. I just I have I want to think on that. I was yeah. thank you for bringing that up. You, you know, there's a um, and in the art, there's an article. It's called Transformational Supervision. Uh, I, I can't remember the art, the, the writer right now. Um, but I see by your face, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and they, it talks about that very piece, right? It talks about that very piece, which is we have this weird evaluative relationship, but if we can move past, and and I'm not saying we we that's not important, right? Because it's not, we have to have, there's a gatekeeping responsibility. There's, you know, and I'm not taking away from any of that, but it's it's a very unique dynamic that we have in navigating that and it becomes pretty challenging really to to try to define this is what this role looks like and honestly the whole thing is very gray mm -hmm. right? i mean it, it can become very very gray well and, and with gatekeeping you know we're reconceptualizing gatekeeping anyways yeah of, you know what that could mean for power privilege dei yeah. all that kind of stuff right so. This is really helpful. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, you know, and, and as we get into even, th and thank you for saying that, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm very opinionated on DEI. I really am. And it's, it's uh, about what it needs to be versus what I see it has become. All right. And that's a very, that's a very fair statement just in watching some of some of the some major corporations that I've seen and worked with where it's checking a box like, well, now we do this and it's not following through and it's not what it's supposed to be. Um, so I'm not, um, you know, I don't want to, um, I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but I do want to just say, because <laughs> I can do it very easily, but you know, even bringing that in, the power differential, and, and that's one of the things in supervision, is that power differential. And yet in mentoring, we're looking at a lot more of an egalitarian. And, and, and so 
how does that, you know, how do you walk that out? And can you walk that out in both sides? I, and I'm going to be very, very transparent, my friends. I don't know. All right. I have a working hypothesis. I really do. No, I, I'm, I have a working hypothesis on it, but I don't know. Uh, and I don't have enough data. I don't feel that I have enough data to back that up. All right. So that's why just in total transparency for just a moment, uh, that's really for me where that lands. All right. That's really for me where that lands. Um, yep. We've lost somebody. That's okay. I'm going to jump into education is defined by title. Uh, in education, two separate, uh, it's two separately defined by title people. You have an assigned supervisor and a mentor assigned to. Yes. And, and that may very well be, um, Melanie, thank you for that. That may well be the route that we need to go. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm recognizing, and I want to be very clear, I, I'm recognizing that there's some gray there that needs to be cleared up. So um, real quick, just in the name of time, uh, I thought this was probably the most appropriate thing I could think of to come up with, um, because that is probably what it's all about. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I'm going to open it up for questions and actually I'd, let me just give you kind of a couple of things because I want to I'm going to change my screen here so I do really appreciate your time your attention um, I do hope this was helpful uh, as always tons of, re of references and literature on this and if you would like to contact me there's my email uh, that's my phone number uh, I am, I work at homesteadcounseling.com where I am the clinical director. Uh, so I am happy to, uh, if you need to find me there, feel free. Uh, as long as I have you for just another minute though, let me pull this up. So where is, where did I put my, oh, here it is. Okay, here it is. No, I'll stop the share. All right. So a couple of quick questions for you, just for funds, just for funsies. According to National Institute of Mental Health, about how many Americans experienced mental illness in 2021? Anybody remember? 57.8 million? All right. Um, in 2020, in 2021, this is all post COVID, by the way, um, depression screens increased. Does anybody remember? 93%, 62%, 57.8 million percent, 63%. All right. All right. Here's your here's your easy question, though. Ready? True or false? True or false? Compassion fatigue, burnout, and vicarious trauma are essentially the same thing. Of course, everybody said false. <laughs> of course, everybody said false. Um, of all the interventions for burnout prevention from support groups, supervision, team building, or individual interventions? What was the one thing that was most effective? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, does anybody remember? Uh, and like I said, I usually like put these up throughout the thing, but I just couldn't get them loaded in in time. Um, which of the following, or what are what was what were some of the benefits? And we'll just do it like this. What were some of the benefits of mentoring?
increased human connection. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Higher promotion rates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, diversity issues, avoiding pitfalls. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are amazing. I cannot thank you enough. No, seriously, I'm so grateful. Uh, I cannot thank you guys enough for hanging out with me thank over the you. last hour or so. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. Um, exactly. mm -hmm. yes. Any other questions? Very any helpful. Other comments? Jeff, I sent you a message. Um, I think our, our research interests are aligning more than I might have realized. So I'm very <laughs> grateful to connect. So uh, I threw, I dropped it in there. <laughs> I, I guess okay, I just saw it. I'm going to I'm yes. going to look that up. I just saw your thing here. So I'm definitely. Yeah, I, I think up. we have a, a more in common than I thought. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, it's so much for me. And I, and again, I apologize, guys. I apologize. I've been trying to kick this thing out. Um, at least it wasn't on what day. What, there was one day that I was, I thought, okay, if this is how I'm going to sound, there's no way I'm going to be able to present. I so my friends are going, oh, geez, Jeff, you've started chain smoking the last three weeks, haven't you? Um, the, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, you know what? <clears throat> We're just going to leave it at this because I don't <laughs> say thank you guys so much. Um, this is this has been awesome and I will stick around. I know we're about three well we're at 55 or 56 53 so i think we're good in terms of uh of nvcc and stuff like that uh i am absolutely happy to stick around if you want to discuss your research i you know to me anything that keeps i'll, I'll try this all right we'll try it now anything that keeps people keeps counselors in the field because i look back even in my own cohort you know, which was when my hair was brown. Um, and I I can count, I think, four people that have actually stayed in, a, in the field over this much time. Wow. Um, some, and, 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 and there's no, you know, there's no, um, some went on to like more administrative stuff, you know, with, nonprofits that kind of thing so i'm not i don't mean it like you know but there's really about four or five of us that stayed in the clinical positions um and i i often wonder what that's about you know is that a is that a and is it a burnout issue or is it even i mean and maybe we need to look at it from an admissions process all right, maybe we need to look at it from an admissions process. Even I don't know. I'm not telling you one way or another. And again, it's one of those things that I very honestly, I'm leaving very open-ended. Okay. I Again, I have my own hypothesis on it, but I don't think um, that's not really the, the most important thing. The most important thing to me is when we get these counselors, how do we keep them in the field, keep them going? And what's interesting is that there's a lot of literature on new counselors. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of literature on new counselors. You know what? There's not a lot of the twenty year plus counselors. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of studies on the twenty year plus counselors, and that to me is also very interesting. So I'm going to leave that in, in in another side of I don't you know I'm not I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's another interesting observation that I, I just noticed in, in doing this. What we're looking at, my colleague and I, with supervision, is we're, we're re, not reconceptualizing, but we're trying to take it more from a wellness planning mm -hmm. perspective to trickle down, right. given those stats that you just were <laughs> reported. Um, but the mentoring piece, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking specifically for community-based folks because that's who I sure. work with. But from a retention and a mentoring piece, it's almost non-existent besides right. maybe like a peer mentor right. every now and then. So this is helpful. 
Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And you know, you, you're so right. It's the, and uh, this is, I, I guess, a room full of therapists. So I'll just say it, right? It's a privileged conversation, <laughs> right? Um, you know, the biggest time suck in my world is hiring therapists. Okay. Like it is the, it's the thing that you spend the most time doing with no payoff whatsoever. There you go. <laughs> right. So keeping the ones that we have and keeping them engaged and keeping them at a point where you're going. And even, you know, I, so it's, it's Friday. No, it's Thursday. Sorry. It's Thursday. Tomorrow <laughs> I will. Yeah. Sorry. I'm wishful thinking it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but on Friday, I will go through the office and I have, I have gone through the office at three o'clock and been like, what are you doing? Why are you here? You know, it's time for you to go. Right. Because, well, I'm, I'm waiting for a client. Okay. You're waiting for a client. Fine. Whatever. You know, well, I'm going to finish my note and then I'm going to go, okay, great. Again, these are the, you know, those are all. Yes. You got to have your 20, 24 hours people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Um, but knowing uh, you know, knowing that, that, that there's somebody who's saying, look, if you're not here, if you don't have a reason to be here, don't be here. Right. Because, oh, I got a student. I shouldn't say this. Well, I will, whatever, you know, what are you going to do? You can't fire me. Um, yeah, I got a student. He's like, well, but I need the, I need the hours. I'm like, Dude, it is 45 minutes. I will give it to you. All right. Go home, get out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You do not need to be here. Mm -hmm. So, but those yeah. those of us who didn't have that, like I never had a supervisor be like, you know what, you should probably go rest. Right. Like there wasn't a, it wasn't a forward thought of right. you probably should rest. But right. what did that whole global pandemic thing show us? You know. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, listen, I have to do no, no, I have to do nothing more than cite. Ready? Hey, what, what, what's your citation for that? Twenty twenty. <laughs> yes. There right? you go. Yes. Like, Just the entire go. year is the right. Right. I was like, but, but but who? I mean, no, twenty twenty, like the year twenty twenty. That that just proved everything. All right. <laughs> That's I what it, it proved the whole thing. Go ahead, me, Cassandra. I, sorry. I said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've got to go. Oh, okay. yes. Yep. Oh, I'm so sorry. We got to go. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks for hanging out. Cassandra, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. I really enjoyed that presentation. Awesome. Oh, yay. Good. <laughs> I was like, and these are the people that have walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you soon. Thanks, Cassandra. See you. Have a good one.